nobody saw her as she gathered scattered grain. Just a Moabitish woman seeking solace in her pain. It seemed more than just a widow, Boaz gave command so kind. Let fall handfuls of purpose till I make the stranger mine. Handfuls of purpose, blotted efforts of grace. Handfuls of purpose brought me to his sweet embrace. When I could not find fulfillment, doomed forever to be lost. Handfuls of purpose. Brought the seeker to the cross. Amen. Good to be back. I read something I want to share with you just a while ago, and I thought it was good. A good pastor will build up his church, and a good church will build up his pastor. Amen? And we work together to do something for the, for the cause of Christ. Amen? Well, I have enjoyed this week. We've got tonight, and one more night, and we're looking forward to uh, what God does with that. And uh, if you would, turn your Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4. I know these pastors know what I'm talking about, but I got home last night, I got to the motel last night, and I thought, man, I should have said that, or I should have said this. I forgot some things. So I'll share just a little bit with you about what I should have said last night. We uh, started in chapter 1. We found Ruth's resolve. She uh, had a resolve to get out of the place that she was in and find what was missing in her life, which was God. And uh, we don't believe, I don't believe that she got saved when she made the decision to leave Moab, but I believe God was doing something on the inside of her, drawing her to him. Then we saw the second service, we saw Ruth's response, and we find her in the field of grace in Bethlehem, Judah, and that's a type of the church. And in that field of grace, she found seed, and uh, that seed had been sown and was being sown and sown in her and on her and she began to feel that conviction and realize that she knew what she needed 
And as we said last night, Boaz approached her in the field. She did not approach him, he approached her. And that how, is how it has to work with God. He approaches the sinner. He lets the sinner know who he is, what they are, and what they need. Then we found Ruth's repentance in that she came to the threshing floor looking for Boaz. He came to her in the field. She came to him on the threshing floor. If a person's going to be saved, they must repent and come to Christ. And so we've, we saw that beautiful picture there of salvation, how she had come, humbled herself at his feet, and, um, and uh, he did something that I didn't share with you last night that I should have. And at the end of that, he put his skirt over her head. Now, that skirt was not the bottom of his robe, but it was the, the prayer, we call it a prayer shawl, tallit. That was called a man's, a godly man's wings. And it would hang almost to his feet. And he used that to bless people with. He, he put it over his head when he prayed. And uh, when, when that man would put that over someone else's head, it meant that I am going to protect you. And it's a type of eternal security. He's showing her, you're mine now. Amen. You belong to me. And I will take care of you. Amen. We can say that, that Christ takes care of us. Amen. When we get saved, we're no longer our own, nor do we have to worry about the things of our own because we have a Savior. Amen. And so he, he places that over her head and lets her know that, uh, and that's the part that people try to make filthy, and we talked about that last night. Nothing filthy in the Word of God. It was, all had a meaning, and that meaning was, I'll take care of you. And so I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm eternally saved. I'm glad I'm not in a foot race with the devil. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, he saved me. And uh, he'll protect me. Okay, tonight we're going to a wedding. We're going to look toward a wedding. We're not actually going to the wedding tonight, but we're going to talk about the wedding. And so we're going to look at that tonight, and we'll look at Ruth's relationship. Amen? She had a resolve to get out of Moab. She had a response and she found herself in the field of grace, the right place. God has a right church for you. Amen. That's where you're going to get fed. That's where you're going to help. That's not necessarily, they're not necessarily hanging, swinging from the chandeliers and throwing songbooks in the air and screaming and hollering. But it's a good doctrinal place that gives you the Bible, that the Bible will help you. Amen. And when the Bible helps you, you're helped. Amen. Amen. I remember when I first got saved, the church of a God preacher led me to the Lord. Godly man, he loved the Lord. Uh, he wasn't right in his doctrine, but he was godly and he loved the Lord, knew, knew how to give people the gospel. Gave me the gospel and I got saved. Well, soon after I got saved, he started telling me I could lose my salvation. And, uh, and so I knew me, I knew I'd lose it before the day was over, so I, I, I had to find somebody to help me. So I went to my pastor, and my godly pastor didn't say, bless God, this is the way it is, and you just believe that. He said, here's some Bible. Gave me some Bible. I went home, got in the Bible, and now I can hang my hat on we're eternally secure. Because the Bible showed me, Amen. The Holy Spirit sealed that in my heart. And so I'm glad we're people of the book. Amen. All right. In, uh, in the book of Ruth, uh, let's, let's do this. It's going to be a little bit of reading tonight, but we want to we wanna do uh, right by the Lord and do it right. Amen. <coughs> All right. <coughs> let's look in verse 1. 
I'm, I'm having a little bit of eyeball problem, so you bear with me. My wife told me I struggled a little bit with reading last night. I do that from time to time. My eyes are going conky because of all this poison in my body, but I'll, uh, I'll do the best I can. Amen. So read along with me. So if I stutter, it's not, it's, it's just that. Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. Behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Now here's the story. He's met her in the threshing floor. He tells her to go home with that 75 pounds of barley seed. And uh, she goes, she carries that through the streets tells her not to tell anybody, and he said, I will take care of the problem. What was the problem? The problem was she needed a kinsman redeemer. And the problem was that she had a nearer kinsman. That Now, remember, Naomi is the one that lost everything. Naomi is the Jewish woman that can have everything restored, not Ruth. Ruth came along because she was married to Naomi's son. Okay? Now, Na Ruth is in the package. If a redeemer buys Naomi out, he has to buy Ruth. And so he said, I will take care of the problem. I am a kinsman, but there's one nearer. And I will go and deal with that person. Now, that's what's happening here. They dealt with those things in the gate. So he goes to the gate. He tells those men there in the gate, the leaders of the city, uh, I need you to hear this matter. Uh, there, there's a matter that needs to be taken care of. This is Boaz, okay? And so, and, and I'm going to explain this briefly. We're not going to belabor this a long time, but we'll look at it. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, uh, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth the parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people, if thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it besides thee. And I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Now I want you to understand something. This nearer kinsman is a type of the law. He's a type of the law, okay? And uh, to the Jewish person, they felt like at times they could keep the law and that would make them righteous. He said, I will redeem it. That's the law speaking. I'll take care of the matter. Okay? Now, Boaz is a type of Christ. Okay? He's not a type of the law. He's a type of Christ. Uh, the law had a sacrifice that was not human, was an animal, wasn't enough to get you completely redeemed. Once a year, that had to happen. There was a day of atonement every year. But thank God Christ came, went one time behind the veil, sat down beside the, uh, the Father, and it was finished. He finished that work. He was the Lamb of God that ended all sacrifice. Okay? So let's read on. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, listen to this, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself. 
lest I mar mine inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. The law cannot save you. What the law does is condemn you. Amen? The law condemns you. The law is your schoolmaster to bring you to God, but it cannot redeem you. And so this man is saying, I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing for to confirm all things a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said to Boaz, buy it for thee, so he drew off his shoe. That was a testimony in that day that when he gave him his shoe, that's simply all this means, is that my bond in it is over. Now what did Christ say? He said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill the law. And what the law could not do, Christ did. Amen. His blood redeemed us, not the law. Not the keeping of the law. It's not possible for us to keep the law. God knew we would not keep the law and could not keep the law. And so Christ came. Thank God we have a Boaz. Thank God we have a kinsman redeemer. Don't that just bubble something up in your heart? So he has purchased her. She's been purchased. Can I tell you our Bible tells us that we are not our own. We're bought with a price. That precious price is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Boaz. All right. Now, look with me. And uh, let's, uh, let, let me here just a second. Let me go back. Look in verse number 13. So Boaz took Ruth. She was his wife. When he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception. And she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. He shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. Now we're going to deal with a majority of that tomorrow night. And tomorrow night we're going to leave Ruth and we're going to, we're going to call tomorrow night Naomi's restoration. And so we're going to look at a timeline, God's timeline, at the time he comes back for Israel. Because Naomi's a type of Israel. Amen? After the wedding, Christ comes back for Israel. And so we'll look at that. We'll look at that time tomorrow night. But tonight, we want to look at the wedding. And we want to look at what's, what we are now facing. We're facing this wedding that is coming. We are Ruth. We are the church. And so we're looking forward to that time of the wedding. Now, um, there are we're going to go through tonight. I don't know if you ever went through a Jewish wedding with them. Have you ever went through a Jewish wedding? Okay, it's wonderful truth, ain't it? And so we're going to do that tonight. I'm, he, he's already heard it, so he, he'll have to say amen louder than anybody. Amen. All right. Now, the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 6.20, If you are bought with a price... Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, looking forward to this wedding is our relationship 
This is our relationship with God. Peter talks about holiness. We, we look at holiness and we think, well, you know, that means dressing right and acting right and looking right. It's not that at all. What it is is our relationship with Christ through the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. We're holy because he is holy. And because he dwells in us, we have a relationship with him. Amen? Not a vulgar relationship with him, but a right relationship with him. He is our savior. He is our, he said in John, in John chapter 15, he no longer calls us servants, but he calls us friends. I woke up in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, and he's my friend. I prayed much for other people. I prayed much for my own self, these health issues, and wake up in the night and pray and ask God to touch my body and help me another day. And he's always been my friend. I prayed and asked him for this meeting and for our church and all the things that God is doing. We, we pray and we have a relationship with him. So we're bought with a price and it's our job to glorify God. Amen. You're bought with a price. Be not servants of men. In the book of Hosea, we, we see a, a picture of the coming redemption of Israel. And, uh, and he says, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. That's yet coming. Joseph to Mary. Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. That's a betrothal, a espousal. Before the, 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 before they came. That spousal, that betrothal means a time, a period of time before the wedding takes place. And they were already considered as good as married. Even though they were just engaged and betrothed, they were counted as just as good as married. But she's waiting on him. We're going to go through this, uh, the whole thing here in just a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, talking about the church. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now that's us. We're waiting the day. What day are we awaiting? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 Verses 13 through 18, I know you know that. There is going to be a rapture of the church. And when he raptures the church, he'll take us to that wedding day. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. I don't know what that, brother, we can preach on it, we can talk about it, but there's no way we can know what that's going to feel like. But it's coming. And just because the Bible says so, I'm looking forward to it. I'm kind of like that little dog. Get the owner went down to the grocery store and he went in and he said, you stay outside. He went inside the grocery store and there's a screen door and that dog just barking and barking and barking and scratching on the door. And the owner of the store said, what's he wanting in here for? He's never seen it in here. He said, he wants in here because I'm in here. I want to be up there because he's up there. My Boaz is up there, and I'm looking forward to that day. Amen? So, let's look at, there is, it's found in the scripture, but there's also a lot of tradition in it, but there is a Jewish wedding. And everything, listen to me, everything that Christ did toward the Jews was to show them he was the Messiah. So everything that he did had significance. It had to do with their customs and things like that. They understood 
what that was. And so one of those things is that Jewish wedding. Now, if you want to turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 45, <coughs> hold your finger there and then turn it also to Genesis 24. We'll study this out and look at it as quick. Well, there's a lot to say here, so we'll, we'll do it as quickly as we can. Verse 13, the Bible says, The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions, that follow her shall be brought unto thee. Now, this has to do with a Jewish wedding. The, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself, so I'm going I'm to try to hold that for just a second. If, if we show the Jewish wedding, we, some things will start to make sense about what we are facing in the future. Uh, I'm no longer mine. I belong to him. The Bible says I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, uh, uh, not yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Are we truly waiting for that date? Are we truly building our relationship with the Lord? So let's look at this wedding. First of all was the arrangement. And if you, if you look in Genesis chapter 24, we find... And, and I'll try not to read as much as, as possible. I'll, I'll try to just kind of go through it. But we find that Abram wanted a bride for Isaac. You remember that story? Genesis chapter 24. If you don't know that, you need to read it. He picks his servant, his head servant, to go after that bride. Now that servant is not named. Now we kind of know who he is because of other scripture. But, but he's not named. He doesn't talk about himself. He goes after Rebecca. And he approaches Rebecca for Isaac. Can I tell you I remember the day that the servant of God, the Holy Spirit, approached my soul about being the bride, about being saved. Do you remember that day? When you start to, uh, to get that proposal uh, to come and, and be a part of the family of God. And so that's what's happened. This Abram has went to her. He is, uh, it's proven by the way she watered the camels that she was the one. And then he invites her to come and meet Isaac, which she has never seen. And you have never seen Christ. But by faith, you know he's real. And you're looking forward to that day. Amen? And so, he takes ten camels and, uh, and, and takes those camels with him. That's a, uh, we'll look at that in just a minute. And uh, he approaches her. He gives her gifts. And, uh, and, and she waters the camels like she's supposed to. And he knows that she's the one and he invites her. Um, to uh, be uh, Isaac's bride. Now, he never speaks of himself. The Bible says in, in John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit, uh, he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto him. All things that are of the Father uh, hath are our mine. Therefore said I uh, that uh, he shall take of mine, and he shall show it unto you. All this business on TV about uh, the Holy Spirit and all, uh, the things that's going on in this uh, movement that's on television, that's a lie. The Holy Spirit points to Christ. The servant, all he would talk about was, was, my, was Isaac, my master. I want you to meet my master. Amen? And that's what the Holy Spirit has got a desire in our heart for is we want to see Christ. 
Amen? Now, notice uh, that he hasn't spoke of himself, uh, and then he is drawing her toward him. No man can come to me except the Father, uh, which has sent him, draw me, him, and uh, <coughs> I will raise him up the last day. Notice he's got ten camels. Ten is the number for glory or testimony. When he showed her those ten camels, he let her know he has the wherewithal to do what's, what needs to be done. Christ has, it was, we talked about that last night, he was able to save us. He had the perfect blood to save us. He was the Savior. And that's a testimony to us that he can not only save us, but he can keep us. That journey that they took was not an easy journey. But she had the camels of grace. Those camels were built for the desert. They were built for the, for the journey. They had the right feet. They had the right eyes. They had the right uh, water hump. They had everything was built for that journey. And so he showed her those camels. Amen. And, and, and I wish I had time to go through all that, but I don't. And, and so there's a, the, the wonderful truth. He said, my bridegroom is waiting and uh, we're going to take this journey. Now we're on that journey. It's not easy sometimes going through this journey. Anybody ever face some difficulty in this life? Of course you have. Anybody ever face, uh, face uh, spiritual battles? Of course you have. Paul said you would. That's what 2 Corinthians 10 is about. That's what Ephesians chapter 6 is about. That's what Romans chapter 7 and 8 is about. We're going to face battles. Amen. But he'll get us through the journey. He's equipped us to get through the journey. That's what that holiness is. That relationship keeps us going. Amen. How many of you would have probably given up a long time ago had it not been for your spouse? Yeah. What a wonderful thing God has done for us. My spouse has kept me going. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't be here this week had it not been for my spouse. Amen. I couldn't come on my own. I mean, I can't do simple things anymore. It's working her to death. She, she loves me and because of my spouse. Amen. And God gets us through this because of our relationship. Amen. And so he's built things for our journey. And so then uh, the Bible talks about uh, dipping from the well there. That well is a type of the word of God. They gathered around the word of God. That's what we're doing this week is gathering around the precious word of God. The word of God will help us. The word of, you ever just be reading the, the Bible. I don't know if it's just preachers. I think it's everybody. Sometimes something will just stick out. I mean, it's almost like it's in bold italics. It's not, but it seems like that. God is emphasizing. That's because it's a living word. All scripture is given by inspiration. That means spirit in. It's alive. Living water. And uh, it helps us. Amen. Then not only that, but the price was paid. There was a bride price. And again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 20 says, we're bought with a price. Ephesians 5, 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave himself for it. There's a price that's been paid. When he showed up in that upper room after he resurrected, he showed them the scars in his hands. He showed them the price that was paid. Sometimes we need to get back to looking at the price that was paid. Remember that story in the Bible, Moses, when the water was bitter? If you'll, if you'll look at that story, the Bible says he showed them a tree there. Sometimes we need to look and see the tree. 
Calvary was our price that was paid. Great price for us. He gave her gifts along the way. <laughs> Has God ever given you a gift? I mean, beyond salvation. Is he not just giving you gifts along the way? Hadn't he loaded you daily with benefits? And you see God just conf just giving you confirmation about things. God ever give you confirmation, preacher, about things? You know, I know he has. Sure has. I remember we went out on deputation. I left. I resigned my church. It was a full-time position there at the church. I left the church with nothing. Went out on deputation. And you know what deputation is. You just get what you get. Went out on deputation. The first meeting we got in was a little church. And it was a, a, a mini church gathering. They had gathered together there. and They kind of made us the center of it. First song they sung, preacher, was, I have never, never, never saw the righteous forsaken. <laughs> or, Amen. And sung that song to us and gathered around us and prayed for us and took up a love offer and said, it's going to be all right. Confirmation. God just helped us every step of the way. Amen. There's been a price paid, but he gives us gifts. He gives us, I, and I imagine this. I imagine little Rebecca sitting up on that camel through the desert. Things have got hard. Maybe in a big old dust storm. We in the south, we don't know what dust storms are till we get out here, and then we figure that out. And uh, getting a big dust storm, she, she starts looking back toward home. I think every time she done that, O. Eliezer gave her a gift. <laughs> you just keep looking that way. Isaac's that way. He gives us gifts. Amen. Now, notice and look in verse 22 of chapter 24, Genesis. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring and a half shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands and ten shekels of weight of gold. Now, the word earring here and uh, I don't want to disturb your doctrine or anything, but the word earring here ne doesn't necessarily mean it was a, a, a ring in the ear. If you look that word up, being all one word, if you look that word up, it actually is kin to nasum, which is a nose ring. And I'm going to show you some other scripture to, to prove that, but it's a nose ring, okay? I'm not promoting nose rings. I'm just saying that's what was done that day. I had a preacher tell me when I wish you hadn't said that, but that there's a truth in it, okay? And I want to I want to share that truth with you. Why? Now, in Genesis chapter 24, verse number 47, the Bible says, and he put the earring upon her face. Now, the earring a uh, earring goes in the ear, not on the face. Ezekiel 16, 12 says, and I put a jewel on thy forehead. And so let me ask you a question. And if, and if I was able to walk, I would do this with my wife. But uh, uh, I'll get you two to do it. If you, got, if you don't mind, stand up. All right. You turn and, and take her by the shoulders and Turn her toward you. Now, if you're going to put a nose ring in her face, she has to face you. You could put it in her ear without her facing you, but when she has to face you, she's looking in your face and saying, I am yours. Amen? And it's a testimony. I belong to you. Okay, thank you. Half a shekel was what? The price of redemption. The price of redemption. He's showing her, I have 
bought you with a price. My master has, those, that, those, that earring didn't come from Eliezer, it came from Isaac. And Isaac placed that in her nose or on her forehead to show her you're his. Amen. You belong to him. He has bought you with a price. And then the Bible says, not only that, but he put uh, two bracelets on her, 10 shekels each. 10 shekels is testimony. A 10, the number 10 is a testimony or a witness. And everywhere she wore those bracelets, she witnessed that I am his. We ought not be ashamed that we belong to him. We ought to be wanting to show that to the world that we belong to him. After all, how did Ruth get to Boaz? A little bitter woman named Naomi. Naomi must have had enough joy of God in her life that she got Ruth to come with her. And so that testimony is important. So, the children of Israel knew when they were disobedient with God, his face wasn't on them. When, he, when they were right with God, his face was on them. And so, we see that picture there. <coughs> he redeemed her. Now, she's wearing the testimony of God. She's wearing these gifts and uh, she's showing that she's been redeemed. Amen? And that's up to us to live our life in front of people. Listen, we're justified. We're justified means we're declared righteous by God. And we're justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. But James talks about a different justification. That's how we justify before men let me ask you a question. If I say I'm a pastor and I come to this church, you find out I've been drinking, running around with other women, uh, doing bad things. Are you going to have much confidence that I'm saved? Not much at all. And rightly so. And I use this testimony often. If I say I'm an apple tree and, I'm, and there's oranges hanging on me, I'm not an apple tree. Apple trees cannot have oranges. Amen. And so what we are, we ought to be showing what we are. Amen. We prove our faith by our works toward men. Not to God, but toward men. And so that's that testimony. Now, the bride is proposed to. Look in verse 4 of chapter 24. But thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred, and take a, a wife unto my son Isaac. So he's telling him to go, and I want you to make a proposal to her. Uh, and, uh, and so Rebecca said, I will, and she came with it. Uh, then, and then in a Jewish wedding, there is a cup that is offered. That cup, the father of the bride, takes two glasses, they sit down together at a table and they, uh, he makes the proposal and he tells her what she'll be getting and she either says yes or no. She says yes. The father will pour drink in those two glasses and they will drink from the, the, the bride and the bridegroom will drink from those glasses. Now remind me because I always forget to tell you the end of this. He takes those glasses and he puts them up. He doesn't do, do away with them. He keeps them. The father of the bride. He keeps those glasses. Okay, there's a reason, and I'll, I'll share that with you in just a minute or when we're through. I won't say it's going to be a minute. Now, he tells her what he's going to offer her. Hadn't he offered us everything? Eternal security, heaven one day, to be with him forever, to rule and reign with him when he comes back. We get to cast our crowns before his feet. What a wonderful thing he has done for us. Now, the preparation. Okay, here's what happens. He makes the proposal. 
she accepts, and then he goes to build a place for her. Amen? He goes back to his father's house, and he builds a place for her to come to. While he is gone, she prepares for the wedding. That's her one and only job, is to prepare for the wedding. This is important. This is what we are doing now. We are betrothed to one. And we're preparing for that wedding day. Amen. Now, let's, let's look at that real quick. She's in training and preparing herself to, to be the bride. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused to you one husband, that I may present you uh, as a chaste virgin to Christ. We have no business running around with the world. We have no business cheating on Christ with the world. Amen. This church does not need the world's music. We don't have to have the world's dress. We don't have to have the world's standards because we belong to Christ. His standards is what we need. Amen. I like that. I like amens in the house of God. I'm like that old preacher said, I'm kind of like an old mule. You give me some water and holler at me a little bit, I do better. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. We read that, that uh, in, in verse 26, the Bible says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife uh, loveth himself, for no man yet ever yet hated his own uh, flesh, but nourisheth it and uh, cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Now, the bridegroom, he has gone back to his father's house. He's building a place for her to come. And, um, and, 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 uh, and, and working on that, he does not know the time when he'll go back. The father tells him the time. Because he would go back now. Christ would love for us to be with him now. And, uh, and I know God the Father and God the Son are the same, and we understand that, but the Bible says not even the Son knows, and so we know uh, that truth, okay? And so he goes back to build this place. Now, what she does while she is waiting, what she does is she prepares her wedding garment. Now, I read to you in, in Isaiah 61.10, uh, or in Psalm chapter uh, 45, verse 13, 14, about that rock gold. And what Jewish women would do, now I had him set these up here because I forgot my handkerchief, is they would get their white linen, their pure white linen. That stands for the righteousness of the saints. Revelation chapter 19 tells us that, amen? And we're going to be wearing robes like that. Amen. Now, there's no robes whiter than other robes. We're all going to have white robes. Amen. But, but, what she would do, the Jews had a way of spinning gold dust into thread. And this thread was wrought gold. It was wrought. It was made. And she would design embroidery in her garment. Okay? So she would sit around all day. She carried that garment with her everywhere she went. That's a reminder that I'm his, bought with a price, stay pure. And while she was sitting and waiting, she would sew things into that garment. 
That's our lives. That's the things that we do for Christ. And I'm going to say something very boldly. If you look at the judgment seat of Christ, it's not for our salvation, for our works. And it is in the context of the local church. What we do through the church, the service, the work that we do through the church is what we're sowing into that garment. Amen? And if you never do that, you're still going to get to go to heaven. But boy, you're going to have a plain garment. Your, your, your work, the Bible says there'll be some there that have no works. They're saved. Yet, as by fire, they're saved. They've got a garment, but there's no embroidery. I don't know about you. But I hope I can hold forth a beautiful garment before my Boaz. I hope when he sees me, when he sees us coming down the aisle. I was at a wedding one time, my daughter, my youngest daughter, she, she practiced a, a betrothal and they never touched each other, never held hands or anything until the wedding day. Now, all of my daughters didn't do that, but my youngest one did. And what a beautiful wedding it was. When he saw her at the back door, he wept. When they kissed in the altars the very first time they'd ever touched. What a beautiful picture of preparing for your wedding. Amen. We've got a lot of work to do. And we ought to want to do that work. And it ought to be our joy to do that work. Sewing in that garment a godly life. A needlework. Patiently waiting. Understanding that he's coming. That was her job, is to wait. And while she waited, she was to work. Occupy till I come, he said. And so we're to occupy and be busy about that. No man knoweth the day or the hour, but it's at hand. Amen? Now, she would also <laughs> carry a candle in her hand all the time. Why would she do that? Because she never knew when he was coming. He could come in the morning. He could come in the, at noon. He could come at night. And when she went to bed, she lit a fresh candle and she put it in the window. So he would know where she was at all times. How, how bright is our light shining? For him. He knows where we are. Amen. And he knows what we're doing. Amen. Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. You're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. <coughs> a peculiar people. That you should show forth. The praises of him. Who hath called you out of darkness. Into his marvelous light. So she would carry that count. Now, the bridegroom, in the fetching of the bride. Now, she has, she's back where her father is, okay? He's where his father is. There's going to come a time when he comes after her. The father's going to say, go get your bride. The bride, the, the uh, uh, um, um, best man will step out and he will, at the edge of town, and he will yell, cup his hands and yell, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. You know the Bible says there's going to be a shout. The voice of the 
archangel, there's going to be a shout, there's going to be a trumpet, and then the bridegroom will come and fetch his bride. He will see that light in the, in the window, and he'll go get her and take her from her father's house. He'll, he's going to take us from this world, and he's going to take us back to his father's house. Amen. Don't know what that looks like, but we'll be there one day. And we'll consummate the wedding. And that's what's going to take place after the rapture. The judgment seat of Christ is to show forth that beautiful garment. And then we are wedded with him. Now I'm going to go through the marriage supper and all that tomorrow night. I don't know about you, but I certainly want a right relationship with the Lord. And if you're here tonight and you're not where you ought to be with the Lord, boy, there's time right now to get that settled. I haven't been working on that garment. Start now. Start now. He's wonderful. He gives you time to do it. And if you'll start now, God will bless you. Can't tell you how many times, preacher, and I know you have in the years you've pastored. I've saw people that have wasted the first part of their Christian life. And then all of a sudden got right with God and become a powerful force in getting souls saved and helping the local church. You could do that tonight. Smallest child can do that tonight. The oldest person here can do that tonight. Used to know a fella in the South. If a man was a junior, a lot of times we just called him junior. This fellow, we called him Junior Loy. He was in his 80s. And I wasn't the pastor at the time. I was assistant pastor and. The pastor told me, he said, Junior Loy is wearing me out. He said he gets about 5,000 tracks every week. Every week. He said, I'm having to order those tracks. I said, well, praise God. What's he doing with them? He said he goes down to the hospital every day. He passes them out in the hospital. If there's a car outside, he puts them on the car. If the window's cracked, he throws them in the car. He goes to the grocery store, puts them in the beer racks. He puts them everywhere. He goes down to the Catholic church and puts them in the offering box. He's just wearing us out. I said, let him do it. Praise God. Somebody needs to be helping him. And he was in his 80s. There's something we can do. Amen. Something we can do. You ever met somebody who just can get people to church? That might could be you. That might could be you. But you, it won't if you don't try. Wouldn't it be wonderful before this meeting was over, if you came to the altar and said, Lord, I dedicate my life to you. If I'm on my job, I'll be talking about you. If I'm, if I'm in the grocery store, Sister Jill was talking about having a captive audience in the bus that she drives. In the grocery store, we have a captive audience. She's checking us out. We have to, she has to listen to what we have to say. You know the greatest place to witness? Gas pumps. They can't go anywhere. Reach your head around and say, hey, how you doing today? Can I give you something to read while you're standing there? Where you go to church? Why don't you come with me? Hey, if you'll come with me, I'll sit with you. You'll be my guest. There's a way to witness. There's a way to get folks to you. To the, to the house, to the field of grace. 
So they might get some seed in them. And that the season might come so that it takes root and grows. Don't you want to have that garment that glorifies God? How about you tonight? Somebody tell me. I'm just going to be honest with God. Nobody knows why you're coming up here, but God knows. And if you'll be honest with him, he'll help you tonight. Start over and do it right. How about you? Ask everybody to stand, Pastor, to come.